right. Welcome to the Chris Gethin Show, a Chris Gethin Podcast, I should say. Now, I got a phenomenal guest who has been on this show before. It was about four years ago. Four years, right. Time has gone. Dr. Darshan Shah, thank you ever so much for number one being on the show and having us in your beautiful beach house here. Oh, it's been phenomenal. My pleasure. My, my hair's pleasure grown back. <laughs> my hair's grown back since That's I've been, been here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been, a, been phenomenal. Great. Good so, to have you. Thank you very much, sir. So um, I've made the introduction at the beginning of this podcast, but since I spoke to you last, which is about four years ago, what's been happening since? Like, I know that you're in the UAE recently, you're expanding Next Health. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're very, very busy. Can you get us just caught up a little bit? Absolutely. Um, over the last few years, when we first, when you first uh, asked me to be on your podcast, I think we only had two locations for Next Health. Yes, right. Yeah. And Next Health, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, bio optimization clinic. We we call it a longevity center, and we also call it health optimization. So we do both health optimization and longevity. And that whole concept has kind of evolved over the last few years. Um, there's so much new technology coming out now, and just a lot more people are talking about longevity and turning back your biological clock. Mm. So that has led to an explosion of people seeking out the services at Next Health, the things that we do at Next Health. And so we've been blessed to be able to expand to New York, also to Hawaii in partnership with the Four Seasons. And then now, as you saw, we're in Dubai in a couple of locations. And we decided to move to a more franchise model so we can offer the things that we do on a more global scale. So we have about 30 to 40 new franchises opening up over the next few years as well. So we'll have Next Health Centers in many countries throughout the world, India, Canada, Australia, and also all over the United States. Wow, that's going to keep you busy. Very busy. Yeah, yes. yeah, for sure. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. So can you tell us just a little bit on, you know, I've obviously been to your centers. I've participated in the modalities that you have gotcha. there. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you offer there? Yeah, so, you know, it all starts with really knowing what's going on under the hood of your biology, right? I think a lot of people, they think they're healthy. They're going to the gym every day. They're eating well, according to what the latest dietitian has told them to eat and they're, you know, they're getting good sleep. I think a lot of people now know about sleep, but those are only, in my view, the basics. There's so much more that you need to know about what's going on under the hood of your biology. Things like what we were talking about, inflammation, um, uh, your hormone issues that might be happening, and not just sex hormones, not just testosterone and estrogen, but thyroid, et cetera. Um, and then even deeper things. Now we know some of the root causes of aging at a biological cellular level, such as mitochondrial disease, telomeres, et cetera. So what we do is you first start off getting a full battery of tests, including a full body MRI, a CAT scan of your heart, and over a thousand different biomarkers that we take from your blood and genetic testing. And then we come up with a plan to, number one, optimize your health from just a habits and routine standpoint. So your sleep, your diet, and your exercise routines. But that's the basics. Then we take it on to a functional medicine level where we work on detoxifying your system, your hormone balances. We work on um, your inf inflammation levels, your gut health. And then once we have all that in order, we have at Next South the latest in longevity technology, things like total plasma exchange, therapeutic plasma exchange, stem cells, exosomes, and we can create a program for you that you can utilize what's gonna help you turn back your biological clock. Wow, mm -hmm. interesting. And you know, as part of this medical process when people come, do you look at, you know, obviously their histories? So for instance, if that person does have metal amalgams, you're like, okay, we're not gonna give you an IV of glutathione and stuff like that, so it is completely customized. Because yes. I find, I, you see now, a lot of these like biohacking clinics have popped up and they don't really do like a medical background other than a, like a quick telemed check to say, okay, you're in good health, great, here's an IV. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, because of kind of the explosion of people looking for these type of services and the longevity, the talk around longevity, people are looking like, where do I go get this stuff done? And we were one of the first here in Los Angeles to do all these things, but because I'm a physician, I have an MD degree and we're regulated by the medical uh, boards in the societies, we always want to make sure that we're customizing. Really, a patient should not be able to just say, 
you know, guess about what treatment is going to work for them. It's really about understanding what's going on in their biology and talking to them and figuring out with their history, with the physical, with biomarkers, what's going to work the best for that individual person. Right. Got right. it. Yep. Okay. Now I've noticed by, you know, I follow you on the socials obviously, and I noticed that you're putting a little bit more content out there in regards to obviously our physical well-being, mm -hmm. activity, making sure that it isn't just the shiny objects and the biohacks. We have to actually put in the hard work. Now, a lot of my audience here come from an athletic background. However, we do know that we're going through a lot of inflammation. A lot of us are very dopamine driven and generally overtrained, maybe under recovered sleep. What do you feel is the perfect balance? So let's say, here's a scenario. We've got an individual that's training like six days a week. Most athletes are. Right. Uh, maybe they're lacking in sleep, they've got family, but they're eating like six, seven meals a day. Now we know that's triggering mTOR, mTOR, mm -hmm. mTOR. We have this inflammation. What can they do to possibly balance it out? Should they fast every now and again, maybe on a non-training day, or should they pull back their training so it's like four days a week? Do you have a balance there that you can kind of spread a sheet over? Yeah, it's, it's all about balance, as you said. And the balance becomes more and more important as we age, okay? So as you spoke about mTOR, this is causing us to either grow or is causing us to recuperate and repair, right? And so as we age, the, the need to grow decreases from just an evolutionary perspective, and we need more recovery time as we, as we grow. So I use, um, I use a lot of different modalities for this type of thing. Um, number one, I believe, let's talk about diet first, right? Mm -hmm. So in diet, you mentioned fasting. I think fasting works really well, but you do need a longer term fast to really activate the mechanisms of senescent clearing. So just an intermittent fast, probably not gonna have as much senescent cell clearing as a longer term fast. So what I try to get a lot of my athlete patients to do, we have a lot of athletes that come to us in Next Health, is do a three to five day fast on a quarterly basis to really clear those senescent cells. And then, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about some supplements that can also help clear senescent cells. Um, secondly, on an exercise basis. So I like to use um, HRV as mm. one of the biomarkers of recovery. And, you know, it's not completely accurate for everybody. I always say go by how you feel internally. But if you don't really know, like, you know, am I recovered enough to really put in a hard day? I like to use HRV to really kind of modify what you're doing that day for your workout routine. You mentioned people training six or seven days a week. And, and I know um, many athletes love to do that. But really, as, um, as you get to 45, 50, cutting back on that routine of exercising every single day and putting your body through that much um, is, is, I think is also important. Now, if you have access to a place such as Next Health or any place that offers some of these modalities like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I think is very important for recovery. Um, in addition to cryo, cryo, any form of cryo, whether it's a cryotherapy machine or a cold plunge, all those things help. And adding sauna to your daily routine is also very helpful. So those are kind of the basics that you can do. And then, you know, there's higher levels that you can do as well um, if, you're, if you have the access to it. Right, mm -hmm. okay. And speaking on the fasting, would that be a pure fast or are we talking like a bit of a Dr. Volta Longo where it could be fasting mimicking? Because I know there's just gonna be a lot of athletes going fast for three to five days. Can I have some calories? What's your thought on that? Yeah, I really like uh, the Prolon program that Walter Longo has put together. Um, he and I have spoke a few times and you know, I, I like it that it's based on a lot of deep science as well. So that's a great program for people that um, are scared of doing like a full, just walk Water fast. Of course, you need to do water. Don't don't eliminate the hydration. But what I found is Vulture's program, the Prolon program, is great for many people. Some people don't really need it. They do it the first couple of times, and then they can do a water fast, and they do they do their body adapts, you know. And after a day, they're not hungry and they're feeling actually pretty pretty good. So I would say try it. Okay, you know? got yeah. it. All right. Now, I got this question from my wife here. She yeah. wanted me to ask you, what do you feel that people regret not doing earlier you know, when it comes to their longevity and their health span? You know, they, maybe they get to 50, 60, or some sort of health complication and go, 
man, I really, really wish I started doing that at a younger age. Yeah, and it's a fantastic question. I deal with this. This is the number one question I get from a lot of the people that come to see us, you know. Sometimes they come in, they're like, you know, I, I've never even seen a doctor in like five, six years. Like, what am I missing here? And really, I, fra I like to frame it like this. You know, there's four things that are likely going to kill you, right? And we know this from epidemiological studies done by the CDC that most men and women are either going to die of a heart attack, which is by far the number one cause of why people die, um, some sort of cerebrovascular disease, right? Something um, that's either a stroke or a heart attack, something going on in their blood vessels. Number two is going to be cancer. Number three is going to be some sort of metabolic disease like diabetes um, or there's a whole spectrum of metabolic disease, right? And so if you're, if you're not watching out for those things at an earlier age, all these diseases start 30 to 40 years before you get symptoms from it. And most people don't seek care for this until they have symptoms, but you need to know much, much earlier. So if you're headed in that direction, you can turn back the cause of this, right? Yeah. So that's what we, that's what we talk about. So um, we can dive in individually into each one of those things if you'd like, but I think that um, you know, these, are, th these four diseases are things that we need to be looking for, screening for as early as it is in their 30s, I would say. You know, when you hit 30s is when you want to really start looking and seeing if you have risk for any of this. Right, okay, yeah. start looking under the hood then. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you mentioned about cancer and heart disease, yeah. and I know that there are indicators that you test for yes. so people can get an understanding maybe that's part of their genome or there's something within them that could possibly trigger it in the future. So how do you test for that? Absolutely. Okay, so... The number one thing I want to encourage your audience to do is become the CEO of their own health, right? And the way I, I like to talk about being the CEO is you, when you're running a business, you are blind unless you're looking at the numbers, right? And so um, you have to educate yourself. Every person, don't outsource this to your doctor. Educate yourself on the biomarkers that are important. There's really about only eight to 10 biomarkers that are important for every human to really know. So if you talk about heart disease, for example, you wanna know what your ApoB level is, mm. right? And so ApoB is a sum total of all your bad cholesterol and making sure that you have this very well controlled from a young age. And a lot of people, 20% of people have a form of bad cholesterol called LP little a. Okay, so this is a protein marker for a genetic form of high cholesterol that even any form of diet exercise is not going to be able to manage. You need to get under some sort of medical therapeutic to manage this. Um, so ApoB is one of those things for heart disease. Now, there's a new test called the Clearly CAT scan of your heart. It's an AI-driven CAT scan of all the blood vessels of your heart that if you've had high levels of ApoB and high levels of inflammation for a while, you really need to get this scan done. Um, it shows us vessel by vessel of your heart how much blockages you have. And depending on the amount of blockage you have, we need to create some sort of therapeutic for you. Now I'll give you a story, like my brother, for example, he's 40 years old and he's a vegan. He exercises every day. His weight is under good control. He sleeps well. And um, he was gonna go on a, a big hike up a mountain, Kilimanjaro, okay? And I said to him, you know, your ApoB has been kind of high for a little while. You really need to go get a CAT scan of your heart done, the clearly test done before you go to Kilimanjaro. He did, he found out he had a 90% blockage of one of his blood vessels that needed a stent. And he's in his early 40s, right? Wow. And so like, you know, I think a lot of people get lulled into a false sense of confidence that I'm exercising, I'm doing everything right that I hear about, I should be fine. And then most heart attacks are dying, most people die of a heart attack um, at their first event, okay? So it's not like they have chest pain for a while and then they go to the doctor, they get their heart treated. Most people, the first event is a heart attack that kills them, believe it or not. So you don't want to be surprised by that. Um, secondly, we can talk about metabolic disease. So I think metabolic disease is another thing. You and I were talking about your carb intake and mm. watching your, your sugar levels. You know, the first sign of diabetes, as people know, is our hemoglobin A1C is, starts to elevate past 6.5. That's when your doctor's going to tell you. But really, it starts way before that when you're developing metabolic disease. So we use things like continuous glucose monitors and insulin levels um, to check for metabolic disease to begin with as well. Um, and lastly, for cancer. So cancer, um, you know, people don't know they have cancer until they get symptomatic. Symptomatic cancer happens at stage three and stage four. Stage three and stage four cancer, you're talking a five-year survival rate now. They're almost completely not treatable along, along all forms of cancer. 
cancer's biggest enemy is being diagnosed as stage one, right? And so there's incredible new screening modalities that are out there, things like full body MRI, the gallery gene test that can diagnose cancers as stage one. If you diagnose a cancer as stage one, it's highly treatable for almost all forms of cancer. So these are the kind of tests that we encourage people to do is really take their testing to the 21st century and do these types of tests instead. Okay, got yeah. it. So I'm sure there's a lot of people out there wanting to know, what do you do? Like, what is your routine, you know, to improve your longevity and your health span from the morning that you wake up to the times that you go to bed? What is your routine in regards to your day and your nutrition and your supplementation and exercise? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, you know, over the years, I've added a lot of stuff to, to my routine, but I you think probably that, removed a lot of stuff <laughs> as well. You wouldn't have the time. Too. Exactly. No, you're so right about that. You know, I believe in the Pareto principle. There's 20% of the actions you take that make 80% of the difference in, yeah. your, in your lifespan. And so really, I think having a morning routine has been incredibly important for me where I, you know, drink a large container of water with some electrolytes in it. I then move on to doing some journaling. I read for 30 to 40 minutes before I even look at my phone. Um, I do a meditation and a prayer as well. And then after that, it's all about getting outside. So I have a rucksack that I use and I go up and down the hill to my house. And that's about a one hour commute walking with a rucksack. And that, you know, that's been for me one of the biggest things that I've added to my routine because as you age, um, you lose that balance and that stability to be able to, you know, go up and down a hill with and carrying heavy things. And so just adding more functional exercise to my day to day has been, has been key. And I try to make it to the gym every day, but a lot of times I'm traveling like you are and it's not, uh, it's not possible. So um, if I can't make it to the gym, I'm a big believer in getting 10,000 steps in no matter what during the day, just keeping that physical activity going. I take my first supplements right before um, lunchtime. And so um, I kind of stick to the basics. I don't have a, I don't have a huge supplement routine just because I've never been good at taking supplements. <laughs> um, and then I do all these things that I was talking to you about a little bit earlier, which is I do a biomarker test on myself, a simple biomarker test called the baseline every quarter to see what direction my biomarkers are going. And every year I do the scanning. I do the full body MRI, the heart scan, et cetera. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then that will dictate what sort of supplements that you should take or what mm -hmm. food or nutritional protocol you should follow based on those markers. So that could exactly. change every quarter then. It could. It ab and it does. A lot of times it does. Yep. Especially, you know, my carbohydrate intake, it changes based on which direction my hemoglobin A1C is going, what my continuous glucose monitor is telling me, et cetera. Okay. Got yeah. it. All right. Now, I know that you're going to be doing a, a talk a little bit later, and I can't wait to watch it, <laughs> all on NAD. Yes. Uh -huh. So, of course, like I'm 49 years old now, and I know that at, after the age of 40, it declines rapidly by about 50%. Right. And uh, so I, I actually got some NAD on me right now. Yes. <laughs> so what, what can you explain to the, the listeners here and, and viewers a little bit about NAD and mm -hmm. why it is so important and should everybody be taking it or are there certain biomarkers that people should look out for to possibly not take NAD? Yeah, so I think it's really important to understand um, where NAD fits into the cycle of our biology, right? So inside of every cell, we have an energy plant called the mitochondria. The mitochondria makes energy in the form of what's called ATP. The precursor to ATP is NAD. So understanding that tells you that every cell in your body needs energy to function. And so without being able to give yourself the precursors to energy, which is nutrition, NAD, oxygen, your cells don't have energy and they can't function and do what they need to do. So what is the benefit of NAD? Well, it's the benefit of every cell in your body being able to do what they need to do, okay? So yes, you're right. NAD levels precipitously decline after the age of 40 and they keep going lower and lower. And that's probably one of the main reasons we age is the cells in our body don't have the ability to do what they need to do at a high level. And so maintaining good NAD levels is extremely important. Um, so so before we had NAD supplementation, people would you know, exercise like high intensity intermittent training, having all the micronutrient precursors, all of that has been extremely important. But now there's a lot of science showing that exogenous NAD actually does increase intracellular NAD so your cells have more energy. So um, should everyone be on NAD? I don't know. I think the, you know, the jury's still out on that. There's huge studies that need to be done. Just from a medical perspective, having controlled randomized studies with 
specific outcomes is what we really need to say everyone needs to be on it. However, I always look at risk benefit ratios, right? And so the benefit to having NAD at optimal levels is very high and the risk of taking NAD from what I've seen in the research is very low. And so I take NAD and I encourage my patients to take NAD. And I've had people come up to me that are in their 20s and yes. say, hey, I know that you're taking NAD. Should I be taking it? Now, should people in their 20s start taking it as preventative measures or should they have some tests or could we look at their background? Maybe they've had, I don't know, some substance abuse in their past, alcohol abuse or just some sort of abuse where they feel that they probably in, they've taken, they've extracted a lot of that NAD so they should possibly supplement with it. Yeah, you just said the key, like there's so many different situations that in your 20s especially, I mean, 20 year olds are the model of optimal health that we use in all of medical research, right? So if you're looking at a healthy 20 year old that has not abused their body, that hasn't um, you know, done drugs or alcohol for a long period of time, probably not needed to have NAD at that point in time. However, if they have any forms of um, alcohol abuse or substance abuse, yes, they've definitely depleted NAD. Um, using NAD is, is um, actually a treatment modality for a lot of addicts right now mm. to actually decrease one of the symptoms of addiction, which is low energy, right? And so secondly, um, I use NAD for my, um, for my younger patients that have metabolic disease. So metabolic disease is rampant right now, starting at even you know, adolescence, right? People mm. are um, seeing the first forms of diabetes development. So we use NAD for those, for those people as well. So it's really at an individualized basis at, the, at that age. But in general, if you're healthy and you're not overtraining, you're not trying to recover from some sort of abuse at, um, from drugs or alcohol, probably not needed, but a lot of people are. You know? Right, yeah. got it, yeah, 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 for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, when we look at stem cells, for instance, you yeah. know, I've had stem cells a couple of occasions. I think it's absolutely awesome, yeah. absolutely love stem cells. And I think to a certain degree, the requirement of it is all dependent on your past history. Absolutely. If you've had a lot of injuries, or like you've gone through a lot of inflammation, inflammation or substance abuse, then maybe the stem cells are needed for that individual a little bit more than the average person. Right. But when it comes to stem cells then, how do you dictate if a client should have the stem cells? Is it just based on injuries or inflammation that that person's dealing with? Or are there other things that you try to cover with stem cell treatments? Yeah, so you know, um, the FDA says that we can't say stem cells treat any specific condition, right? And that's because it's true, there aren't large research studies that show that stem cells are effective for any specific condition. But what I can tell you is that utilizing stem cells for people that have had injuries and inflammations has been a game changer mm. in many, my practice and many physicians' practices. So anecdotally, we can say that injuries do heal faster. We do see inflammation decrease with stem cell therapy. Now, who needs stem cells? We just don't know yet. It's, a, it's another one of those leap of faith that um, the potential benefit is very high for longevity purposes for decreasing inflammation. However, and the risk is probably pretty low. Like we don't see a lot of bad things happening when we give people stem cells if the stem cells are processed correctly. Mm. So, you know, if you can afford it and it's, um, you're willing to take the leap of faith, um, you know, more power to you to do it. It's kind of like we said with the NAD. But as physicians, we can't say that it treats any specific condition. So, and that being said, I do them quarterly myself. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. So you, just to put that out there. I, I myself do stem cells on a quarterly basis. And do you have them taken like in acute areas where you're going to go through wear and tear like your knees or mm -hmm. is it more of an IV or both? Yeah, um, I, I'm using it for generalized inflammation management and so IV, but, um, and I've been blessed not to have injuries in my joints and not need them in my joints. Um, but we have used it for joint injuries on people and with incredible results. Right, mm -hmm. okay. And what about for aesthetic purposes as well? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your skin, I'm like, you've got phenomenal well, skin, you you're so looking much. very, very good. <laughs> and I know that you're an, an expert in this area as well. Yeah. You know, what from an aesthetic standpoint, we all wanna look good, we wanna have great abs, six pack, of course our heart is the most important muscle, but we wanna look after our face as well. No point having a, you know, a body looking exactly. young yeah. and aesthetic if we don't have the aesthetics and you know, youthfulness to our face. But I know that it is exposed to the elements a lot more than any other part of our body. So what are your suggestions and the tips 
that we can take away for a, an aesthetic, you know, youthful yeah. looking face. Yeah, keeping your face looking youthful. So um, there's a few things that you can do. And I think, um, you know, we, it's all individualized once again. We actually do a scan of people's faces so we can see how much UV damage they have. We can quantify their wrinkles. We can quantify their red spots, et cetera. But in general, I would say, you know, we know that collagen levels decrease over time as we age. So really boosting your collagen consumption is a really good idea. So I, you know, supplement with collagen on a daily basis, 10 grams of collagen. Collagen. Um, the other thing that I recommend for a lot of our patients is if you haven't looked into things like Botox and fillers, they're helpful, especially if you're having um, areas of increased wrinkling. So that's you know individualized completely for people as well. Um, and then um, hair as well. Looking at your the amount of hair you have and how how your hair is thinning, especially for it's for men and women, but a lot of men have men pattern baldness that really makes them look a lot older than they are. And so we do a lot of hair treatments as well, such as PRP to the scalp, and we even refer people for hair transplantation surgery. So just kind of having an overall look at the face and not being scared of some of the newer modalities that are coming out there that a lot of plastic surgeons provide is helpful. And then of course, like you said, you're exposed to the elements. The, the more you can decrease the amount that your um, face is exposed to UV light is also going to be helpful for mo most people. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. And, uh, and staying hydrated as well. It's oh, got to yes. be a big thing as well. Absolutely. Like I noticed like whenever I yes. go and visit my family in the UK and it's just the, it's just the culture. Nobody drinks water. It's tea and coffee. And if you're in the cafe, no one's bringing water to you. That's oh, for sure. I know. So hydration is a bit, is a big part of it for sure as well. Great and work. The one thing that I want to touch on as well that is very important to our overall health, and we know that we have more gut bacteria than DNA itself mm -hmm. and can help with a lot of hormone optimization, is the gut microbiome. And we know there's a lot of issues going on, leaky gut, gut dysbiosis, etc. Not as much opportunist flora as we should have. What can we do to optimize our gut health, which can, correct me if I'm wrong, lead to other issues could lead to a possible, possible chemical imbalance in the brain if you don't have the right gut microbiome optimized for hormonal health. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's more serotonin produced in your gut than in your brain, and so by, by a factor of like 20. So the gut-brain connection is real, and it's becoming more and more scientifically validated that when you are having issues in your brain, such as brain fog, even Alzheimer's disease, cognitive impairment, attention deficit, a lot of those things actually start in the gut. So that's just one example why the gut is important. The other example is inflammation, as you mentioned. We know that inflammation is the root cause of all disease. Well, most inflammation begins in your gut and in your mouth. So making sure your oral hygiene is good and your gut is treated well is extremely important. And so um, how do you maintain a good, healthy flora in your gut? Well, the number one thing you can do is eliminate processed food from, from your diet. So processed food is like a nuclear bomb to your gut. And so keeping that an absolute minimum, eating as much whole foods as you can and sourcing your food well, organically sourced, you know, pasture raised, ocean caught fish, et cetera. You want, you want all of that to be like really on point. And then most people don't get enough fiber in their diets as well. So the gut bacteria depend on fiber, both insoluble and cellular fi soluble fiber. And so getting at least 40 grams, if not you know, a little bit more than that on a daily basis <clears throat> is extremely, extremely valuable. And then a lot of people ask the question like, should I be taking probiotics? And so you know, if you're doing all those things right and you don't have a lot of gut symptoms, then probably don't need probiotics. I take probiotics on a daily basis just because it's hard to get that right every day. Mm. You know? so, yeah, for yeah. sure. And what about, you know, while we're on the subject of supplementation from probiotics, you know, of course you can take some sort of fermented foods or mm -hmm. sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, etc. So a lot of people out there cannot consume the amount of vegetables. You know, we yeah. always say, you know, mm -hmm. eat the rainbow. Or Mark Hyman always says, eat the rainbow on your plate. Yeah. Um, what about greens powders? Yeah. Can that replace all the vegetables that people usually can't consume? So when I talk about vegetables to people, I tell them, you know, 500 to 800 grams a day. That's like two large salads of vegetables a day. Um, I aim for that, but it's, it's almost always impossible to get that many vegetables in per day. And with vegetables, you're getting a lot of different things from vegetables. You're getting the phytonutrients, the micronutrients, and you're getting the fibers as well. So powders like AG1 or some of these mm. green powders, I really like them. You know, instead of taking a micronutrient tablet, like a multivitamin, I'd use a powder um, in my morning water as well. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great way to get your micronutrients in, your phytonutrients in. 
you still need to add fiber if you're going the powder route. Okay, got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of a morning cocktail, so tell me, is it okay to mix all these things together or should they be separated? If we're having like greens, we're having some lemon juice, maybe a little bit of apple cider vinegar, we're having some ionic uh, minerals yeah. added to it as well, and possibly some creatine, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some essential amino acids. Can that be all mixed together? It may not taste the best, but uh, the AG1 actually tastes pretty good in there. Yeah. It, it destroys a lot of the, the horrible taste, taste yeah, in there. Exactly. Yeah, it's quite nice. So yeah. if you mix those all together, is that okay? Or would they some, somehow counteract against each other? I think it's fine to mix it all together. You know, I think, you know, we, when we eat things in general on, our, on a plate of food, like you're mixing a lot of different things together when you're eating proteins and vegetables and all this. So I think it's fine. Um, I don't know the answer fully unless you show me exactly what you're mixing together. And then I'd have to probably do some research. But I mix a lot of this stuff together. There's a new powder out there called Momentus. Have you heard of this powder? No, I haven't. It has like everything in it. It has mushrooms and it has NAD and it has um, like all the things you just talked about. And so, um, and I know they've done a lot of research, so I do like that. That's what I've been using lately. Momentous. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to check that out. I'll check that out. Right. Okay, one other thing, because I know you've got your seminar you've got to yeah. get ready for uh, here very, very shortly, is now we know the environment is very, very different to what it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. People are getting diagnosed at a much earlier age with cancer, uh, diabetes, heart mm -hmm. disease, etc. And we know we're getting penetrated by non-native EMFs. Uh, we're up later being exposed to artificial light. And then we have the phthalates that we're putting mm -hmm. on our skin, the plastics, the microwaves, blah, blah, blah. I could go on. Now, we could become obsessed with trying to completely control this environment. And I you know, try to mitigate myself from a lot of the EMFs. I'll have the phone case, the fanny pack. It isn't because I'm a bodybuilder. It is a defender shield, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I try to earth myself. It's great that we're right by the ocean here mm -hmm. so I can earth myself first thing in the morning, get the sunlight first, th first thing in the morning. What are the basics that people can do that would, like you said, give them, you know, they invest 20% in to give them their 80% re uh, return in today's day and age to stay healthy? So... With all my patients, I take them through a detoxifying journey, I call it, right? And it is based on the Pareto Principle. What's the 20% you can do now to detox 80% of your life? So we always start with air, water, and food, okay? So your air, where do you spend the most time? If you are in an area that's polluted, you live in a big city, or you live close to a factory, et cetera, you're spending the most time sleeping in your bedroom and at work, usually in your office. Both those areas need to have an air purifier filter that works really, really well. So I mean, most of your hours, you're in filtered air. Um, if you are in a clean environment, then opening the windows in those areas is extremely important. Water. I tell people, you know, drink water as much as possible from a reverse osmosis or a filtered source. So put those also in your work and your home environment. And always drink on a glass or metal containers that you, you're sure don't have any, you know, toxins that can be leached out of those. And then finally, your food. Shop eliminate ultra processed food and shop organic as much as you can. Okay, so now once you got those three things in place, you can feel pretty comfortable that you've done a pretty good job detoxifying a big part of your life. Now you start diving in on an individual basis to things like what cosmetics are you using? There's a great app called Think Dirty that you can scan mm. the barcode and find something better. You know, the, Then you start looking at decreasing EMF, so unplugging your uh, Wi-Fi at home, keeping your phone in a different room, et cetera, when you sleep at night. Remember, there's two parts of exposure to toxins. It is not just the toxins themselves, but it's the time amount that you're exposed to these toxins. So if you you know, if you're not going anywhere where you need to wear colognes or perfumes and makeups, don't wear it. That's more time you're spending away from these toxic exposures, right? And so this is kind of how we go through this journey of detoxifying their life. And it does take, I say, give yourself a year to really get this right and be you know, don't be so hard on yourself. You don't have to do everything today on day one, you know? It's, it's give yourself some time to get this, get this plan into place because it only takes a year and then you, you have it in place for the next 50 years, right? Yeah, so yeah that's exactly. I, I, think, I think that's right. You know, you said yeah. the right thing there weird. Don't get stressed out if you cannot do all these right. things. Because I'd wake up in the morning, I'm like, I gotta get my sauna, I gotta get my cardio, I gotta get my red lights, I gotta get my meditation, all these things. I thought, 
God, I'm getting stressed out yeah. trying to invest in my health, right. which is probably not right. doing my biological age any favors. So now I'm like, okay, well, if I can do the red light a few days a week, maybe the sauna a couple of times a week, right. and an ice bath, okay, that balances itself out. And just being a little bit more laid back and relaxed about it just makes yourself feel better about it. And you're probably going to have less inflammation because of it. Exactly, exactly. You know, one of the things that bothers a lot of my patients is they can't meditate. Like they don't have time to meditate or they just can't get into a meditation that day. And they get themselves so stressed out about it that they almost give up on going to the gym that day sometimes yeah. or eating right that day. And I tell them, look, it's perfectly normal to not be able to meditate on a daily basis. Replace that with something else. What about five deep breaths? Do a breath work practice instead. That's something you have to breathe. You might as well do, a, a, do it in a practice form. And then you've replaced that one habit with something else. Same like if you can't make it to the gym that day, go for a walk. Do these little micro replacements so you don't feel so bad about yourself on a day-to-day -day basis and you don't get stressed out about it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Because <laughs> I think that's what happens. We get overwhelmed. And we do. Whenever I've done a seminar, I'll say to people as well, um, have you meditated? Everyone puts their hands up. Mm -hmm. Do you meditate? No one puts their hands up. Because it's difficult. <laughs> it is hard. You can't get stressed and frustrated about it. Right. If you hear noises outside, Invite it in. Mm -hmm. Don't try to shut it out because that's where the frustration comes. Exactly. But I think it's also important to recognize that meditation, breath work, does have a really significant brain health and longevity benefit. So I think people need to understand that so that they do add it into their world in one way or the other and not just totally discount it as, um, you know, I can't do it today, so I'm never going to do it kind of a thing. Yeah, <laughs> and some people uh, try to invest into all the stuff that costs them a lot of money first as opposed to the basics in the beginning because it's right. free. You know, if some, if some people pay for something, they feel that they get more value out of it yeah. as opposed to something free, they don't value it as much, but right. there's a lot of value there. It's so funny you say that because so many of my patients are like, just send me an Amazon list of everything they need to buy to be, have better longevity. Like, it's not an Amazon list. It's your <laughs> habits. the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah, exactly. It's the same with right. my clients. I'll say, oh, I, I'm starting next week. Tell me what supplements I need to go out and purchase first. I'm like, no, no, no. We're just going to focus on your sleep and hydration first. Right, right. Then we'll talk about the supplements after. Exactly. If you're not even training to failure, then what's the point of taking a lot of these right. supplements? You know? Right, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, thank you ever so much. Oh, really be so an welcome. absolute pleasure, my friend. This is a lot yeah, of fun. This is a lot of fun. Everything that we've spoken about as well, we'll put uh, in the show notes. We'll put all the links for you guys to find. Now, if should people want to find you, Next Health, have any questions for you, where can they do so? Yeah, um, you can go to my website, drshah, D-R-S-H-A-H.com, and you can fill out a form there, and I can answer your questions for you. And then I'm on Instagram at, at darshanshahmd. Okay, yep. great. And we'll put those links in the show notes yes. as well. Thank you ever so much, and we're going to watch you talk all about NAD, NAD at Brooke Burke's place. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yes, looking yeah. forward to it. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. All right, appreciate it. Yeah.